Hello, listeners. Amos here. And I wanted to give a quick aside to the episode this week. The last couple months have been pretty crazy for Kent and I for a multitude of different reasons. However, um, we're, well, I am trying to correct the publication schedule. So in the next few episodes, they will be coming pretty quickly and possibly out of order because, well, let's face it, Kent is very slow on producing the episodes in which I do not appear. Go ahead and tweet him at rm underscore del noche on Twitter and tell him how displeased you are that the episodes are out of order and whether or not they are his fault, he will take the blame because I said so. Yeah, that sounds like a good reason. So anyway, this episode coming up was recorded a while ago, and it is a very fun episode. Um, I hope you hang around for the whole thing. And, well, I would apologize, but, I mean, we're 253 episodes in. If you don't expect these snafus by now, are you really listening? No, really, I'm, I'm kind of sorry. So take my apology and listen to the episode and tweet at me at Ethan Kane on Twitter and tell me how much you disapprove of these, uh, episode intros or, or how much you like them. Oh, I'm, I'm, who am I? Nobody prefers these, but that's what it is. And this is what it is. And here is your episode. Okay. Are are you about ready to start? Yes. Uh, Steven, are you about ready? I'm good. Okay. Okay. All right. If you're ready to push the button, Amos. Uh, I got to make sure I'm hitting the record button, not the end stream button, because that that that's happened before. <laughs> because of course it did. Yeah, and and then of course Kent's like, well, why don't you just have it auto record when you start the stream? And I'm like, because I don't want to edit the front part of the video out when I don't. <laughs> and the, uh, uh, see, I can already play the conversation out in my head. I don't need you, Kent. <laughs> You can play both roles. I I can. All right. Three, two, one. This week on the Ritual Misery podcast, Amos did some renovating. Well, not yet, but I'm gonna. Uh, I was filled with dread this week. Uh, That's often a symptom associated with the fuel rats arriving to help save you. But most importantly, we've got Stephen Haywood from the Tech Buzz. Yo! <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Ritual Misery Podcast, episode 253 for Thursday, the 23rd of July, 2020. This is a show where two lifelong friends and their guests celebrate all things geek. I'm Amos, that's Kent, and yes, I, I know... I know I told you how it was going to go, and I know I'm the reason it screwed it up, (laughs) because I didn't have my soundboard ready to go to hit the button to start the damn show. It's not his fault. It's my fault. Stephen Haywood, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Uh, I mean, pre-show jitters out of the way, right? (laughs) (laughs) Hey, I even kept so. I kept it simple for you. And that's probably what threw me off. I was like, oh, no, no, it didn't. No. (laughs) I threw myself off. Oh, the guest did it right. Oh, yeah. God. What I, do I do? <laughs> not the previous guests haven't done it right. They've just done it their way. <laughs> all right. That's all, the P- <laughs> that's all the PC I have for you today. That's it. That's all I got. I, I don't have any more PC. Um, hey, dude. Uh, we have decided we're going to... So we've had re- several renovations available for our house lately. Like, we're going to do the backyard. We're going to do a, a porch. We're going to get a fence. We're going to... And we said, you know what? We're just going to go the easy route and get our heater replaced, add an air conditioner, add some air filtration, get a new water heater, a uh, water filtration system, and call it a day. Because that's that's got to be easier, right? Uh, doesn't <laughs> sound easy to me. That sounds like an HVAC overhaul. Um, yeah. I take it it wasn't easy. Uh, well, we haven't done it yet. We, we're, it should be starting <laughs> next week. <laughs> well, best of I'll, luck. I'll, there man uh yeah it's it, yeah i'm uh yeah but i mean at least it's going to something that's useful in the house because yeah um and i'll have air conditioning for the first time in four years i only need it one week a month or one week a year but that week is miserable 
<laughs> oh, good lord, uh, Stephen, have you have you been doing any renovating or or uh, home improvement type stuff? You know, I just had to change out the anode rod in my hot water heater that I replaced back in October of last year because I started getting I have well water, so mm. I started getting sulfur smell, Ooh. and you would think they would have put the correct rod in it, but no, <laughs> they didn't do so. They had to come back almost a year later and change the rod out to an aluminum one. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to, I, I, that's pretty bad. I went to change my, <laughs> my rod in my, uh, water heater last, uh, this last winter, actually I went to change it and come to find out that I don't know what's wrong. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I did it wrong or whatever, but our anode rod is seized into the tank where it can't come out. It just yep. won't. So there's no, that's why it's early. Yeah. They said that'll that'll happen. Yeah, so that's one of the reasons why we're getting a new water heater. Plus, we're getting the instant, like the the limit uh, unlimited hot water Tank. one. Tank. Tankless. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because well, I'm tired of running out of hot water. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give a quick shout out to our raiders. Uh, thank you, TSC and Sam for for raiding. Welcome. Um. um hey, uh, TSC and Sam, or Tuscan Sam, as I call him. He's going to be on the show soon. Like, we're going to have him on the show soon. Hell yeah. He's going right? to be our guest in two weeks. Yeah, see? I, I, I thought I saw that. Okay, cool. Um, I, well, see, one of the reasons I brought up my renovations, because I know, uh, Stephen, you recently moved into a new house. I would say recently, like last year or whatever. Moving into a new house and uh, had to completely rebuild your studio, which I'm going to ask you about later, because I have que- I, I has questions. Um <laughs> But yeah, uh, how much work actually, like how many hours of work did you put into that new studio? Cool. It was five days straight for about 15, 16 hours a day. And that's, that's Ooh. no, my wife, my wife will tell you. I mean, I had to literally, because it's all up here, right? Because people always ask you, oh, do you have it all written down? No, it's, it's up here and nothing's labeled, of course, because when you initially installed it, you were kind of learning as you were going. So you didn't. You didn't label anything, right? So I had to say, don't need that, need that, don't need that, you know. And then I end up with a pile that I do need and a pile that I didn't need. And that was just like two days of just doing that. Mm. <laughs> it's just, ugh. <laughs> Kent, uh, yeah. how, how's your new studio doing? Uh, it's how, great, man. How much work did you put into uh, that? Uh, carrying your laptop about- to a different room and making sure the Wi-Fi worked. Yeah, about uh, about seven minutes, I think, it took me today. So. <sighs> oh, man. Uh, but, yeah, speaking of, of tech and putting tech in places and carrying stuff around, um, Amos, do you, do you ever play video games in the bathroom? I have. I have a TV in my bathroom that I have to use an extension cord because there's no plug near it. And I have uh, hooked up the old, uh, I think it was the Chromecast, hooked up to there and, and sat there and played a game on my phone on the TV. While I was on the shitter. That's hilarious. What about you, Steven? <laughs> so you asked about renovations. This is one that I just did recently. So I'll, I'll, I'll save you the trouble here. You guys can take a look at this. Ah, so this is my bathroom down here in the studio arcade area. And I, yes, I installed a Sega Genesis on the wall and <laughs> my wife's like, Hey, it's your bathroom downstairs and you and the kids share it for, you know, while you're working and stuff. I had to share the commode so people knew that I legitimately put that in there. Um, and my wife's like, hey, this is actually cool. So when she goes down to help my son in the shower, she'll sit on the commode and play Sonic or um, <laughs> whatever's on. So I didn't, get, uh, I didn't get a lot of flack from it. So I was actually surprised. That's awesome. That's amazing. That my, is amazing. My setup wasn't that glorious. Uh, I had to, my, 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 my uh, we, have, we have a large tub, like one of those oversized tubs, jet tub or whatever. And it's opposite my sink. And then the shitter is on the other side of a little partial wall between my sink, you know? Um, yeah. The TV is over the the big tub and it's on a swing arm. But the nearest outlet is at my sink. Because when they put the TV in there, they didn't think, hey, we're going to plug this in sometime. So there's no power anywhere near the tub. Because why would there be, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So my, my setup was no near that glorious. Well, I think what they did was when they they paneled like this whole basement has it's finished but it has that that 80s paneling that wood paneling so obviously they didn't insulate anything so where my sump pump room is you can get to the back of it and all i had to do is 
cut a little hole for an outlet, and tap into one of the other outlets, and boom, I could put <laughs> right there, right below the TV. That's so awesome. it worked out really well. That's perfect. right on, right on. Yeah, I, I, hey, uh, I don't have that look. Hey, Amos, you remember a couple weeks ago when I mentioned the RPG called Dread? Yes. And then, so you, shared, then you shared a character sheet with me. Yes. So I I played it this weekend uh, with Lucas, uh, my son, as the dungeon master or the game master, I guess. And tell me, um, how did your uh, pubescent jock go along within the story? Did, so he, the did idea, he get to see them titties? So, so to recap. So, so to recap, uh, everybody, catch everybody up here, what Dread is, uh, it, it, it's basically an RPG horror story. And instead of using dice or a, a randomizer for solving in, like or resolving encounters, you instead use a Jenga set. And as you make decisions, you have to pull a, a Jenga piece. And if you fail, you die. And it is a brilliant mechanic because the the DM or GM, uh, d- you know, part of their job is to to make it scary, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, make make it nerve wracking, uh, you know, r- raise the tension levels. And having to pull a Jenga piece from a a swaying tower just increases the tension so much. Uh, by the end of it, like your heart is freaking racing not just from the imagination of of the scenario that you're put in but but the your your nerves are just frayed trying to get this this tower to not fall over it it was amazing and not only was the gameplay fun but i had a blast creating the character uh the idea was to yeah the idea was to go mute because we can't hear anything you're saying now Oh, good lord! <laughs> now he's back. Now he can. Oh, that that, I that was, was weird. First, I thought I thought I unplugged my headphones here. Right, in my I, pocket. Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. That's weird. I don't know what happened there. Um, uh, I, mean, yeah, I, there. I think it was intentional. Yeah. I think you just filled us with tension as you were trying to <laughs> tell the story about how the Jenga might fall. Yeah, so it, w- it was a blast. Not only was it f- uh, super fun to play the game, but it, the character creation process was a lot of fun as well uh, because the idea was to create a character that was based on like 80s slasher movie tropes. And I created the douchebag jock named Kyle Thompson. And uh, he, he fit all of the, uh, like all, all of the tropes of just being a, a complete uh, douchebag. Like for example, uh, um, what are you scared of? So instead of a, an actual character sheet, like a D&D style character sheet, you fill out a questionnaire where you describe like your, your fears and uh, strengths and things like that. And uh, for, for what am I afraid of? I said, my dad losing and my friends finding out that I'm a virgin. <laughs> so it, anyway, it was a blast. It was so much fun from the character creation process all the way up until the tower fell uh, probably about two and a half hours into the game, it was super fun from start to finish. It was amazing. So I highly recommend that to anybody. Uh, look up Dread RPG, and uh, you can learn all about it. Sounds awesome. I my my problem with it is that you can't really do that remotely unless you have a camera aimed with you and the Jenga board at the same time. And then, mm-hmm. like, what happens if your little sister runs in and smashes your Jenga board and <laughs> runs out of the room? Like, you know, and, and this game seems, it, it, it would seem to have the Ravenloft problem. Now, mm-hmm. are, are you guys familiar with the Ravenloft problem? Uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to as the Ravenloft problem, uh, but Ravenloft is a Dungeons & Dragons uh, campaign setting that is intended to be scary. It, well, okay, so the Ravenloft problem is that you can play Ravenloft, like you can play D&D in the Ravenloft setting, it's it's fine, but you don't get the full feel of it unless you have a very good GM who can mm-hmm. fill in those details and have stuff prepared to set the stage and give you the the mental visual of what's actually going on and how it's happening. Mm-hmm. Like you, There's a certain type of GM that can handle Ravenloft and 98% of GMs cannot. 
because yeah, it's so, such a visual and such a sensational uh, platform to play a game in. And this seems like it would have that same problem. I mean, I'm sure Lucas handled it just fine, but it's it would seem that's, like that's what this game say. would have yes, that same yes, problem. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it does have the handicap or the, the advantage, I guess, of having the Jenga board that adds the tension. Uh, but Lucas is a very talented uh, GM. He was very descriptive and, and did a very good job of, of uh, getting us in the right place uh, mentally for it. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was, that's just one of those things, man. Like, I, I, I love, I've played Ravenloft a few times and I love the world, but it's only been done right once. And it's just mm -hmm. so rare mm -hmm. to find a GM that can, that can handle that and not make it, not make it funny. Like, keep it serious and keep it somber. It's so good. Uh, Steven, do you do you play RPGs like pen and paper RPGs? Not really, no. Okay. Well, that that explains why you ha you've had a blank face on <laughs> since you start talking yeah. about Ravenloft. <laughs> RPGs I play like in video game form. I don't play like physical. Like I remember there was a card game. Was it something midget? Does that sound familiar? There was like a. Then an ex-girlfriend's dad, he was all about it. Um, uh, I, It's kind of like a, a clue mystery type of a game. I thought it had something to do with Midget. <laughs> I'm not familiar with that I, game. Uh, okay. But it's a no. card game. There's, it's, oh, it's oh, oh, you know what? You're probably talking about Munchkin. Munchkin, there we go. Talking. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I was like, oh, I have the box right around that door. Right, It's, <laughs> it's, it, it's on the table out there because we were just playing not too long ago. And... I can't think of the damn like yeah, it's been that kind of game. I think that had something to do with, like, the, and now mind you, this was like 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, so I he had got me this because we used to play that on a Saturday night because my girlfriend would work. He'd have me come over with the guys and we would play that, and I knew nothing about it. My girlfriend's like, oh, just go over there and you know humor my dad, and he gets into this thing, and it was actually fun. But then after we broke up, I had no interest in it. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> open doors. I play. Open doors, yeah. kill monsters, screw your friends. <laughs> I believe that Amos, is the tagline. Tell, tell us about fuel rats. Okay, well, speaking of attention, I've been telling you, uh, I've been I've been spraying praise for this game for uh, a couple weeks now, probably about a month, month and a half now. It's called Elite Dangerous. And it is, uh, I, I can't stress this enough, it is the American trucker or, you know, European trucker of space games. There's no point to this game. You just go and make your way. There's ways to make money. There's no, no I mean, you assign yourself quests. Um, you, uh, th there's no, you don't win Elite Dangerous. You just play different aspects of it until you get tired of it and you move on to something else. And then you return later. Um, one of my favorite things in a game is being able to help new players. If I know enough where I have the capabilities to help new players, it happens to me pretty often. Like when I started playing elite dangerous, I worked my way up to like my third ship. And then I happened to group up with this dude that was like, Oh yeah, here's 50 million credits. Uh, have a ball. I'm like, Oh, <laughs> awesome. Well, I don't play often enough or long enough to have 50 million credits just to throw at people, you know? Um, but there's always this danger in Elite Dangerous that you could go out too deep in space and either not be prepared to come back or make a mistake and end up stranded with no fuel. This has been solved by a group called the Fuel Rats who actually oh. have an IRC server that if you're playing Elite Dangerous and you run out of fuel, they have all these procedures in this chat room and this website and everything else and without compensation, in fact, it's almost, I wouldn't say strictly, but it's forbidden for you to receive compensation for your assistance. They grab a volunteer force and they send someone out there to refuel you. And yeah, that doesn't sound like too much fun. Like if you're playing American Trucker and you're, you're, uh, you ran out of gas, like, oh, another player is going to come give me gas. That, you know. But when we're talking about, this is a scale replica of the Milky Way. So it is not uncommon. I was watching one earlier today. It was 1,400 light years outside the bubble, which is already a couple hundred light years. It's like a thousand light years all the way around Sol, which is you know our our solar system. So if you are, you know, you basically they were 2,500 light years away from Earth. 
That's that sounds like where I live in New Mexico. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then to to help that person, they they obligate themselves to help. Like they will help no matter what, even if they're on the other side of the galaxy, whatever else. And there, there's only one fuel rat that's online right now. They will drop whatever they can. They might finish a quest and then go help. But it was such a long time to get there. Like you're talking 30 or 40 minutes to jump that far if you're just jumping as often as you can because of the limited range of your ships. And that's what they did. This dude finished a quest and then just started jumping. He was 108 jumps away. The the admin, like the person that the you know the the dispatch in the chat room literally told the person, the player, hey. We have your position, roughly, because you can't be exact until you're in the same solar system. We have your position. Go ahead and log off and come back in 25 minutes. <laughs> because the entire time you're Jesus. in the game, you're using fuel. And then I've, I, I saw some videos or everything else, and this is what inspired me. I'm, I'm totally doing this. Like This is just my thing, right? Um, they have what's called a code red, which is when you're out of fuel and you only have emergency oxygen left. And the longest you can have emergency oxygen is 15 minutes. Now, this seems stupid, right? If you if you die, what happens? Your ship blows up. You, you pay an insurance cost, which is usually just a pittance, and you start a quest again. But what if you've been out, out in the deep space for a couple of weeks gathering these ultra rare mat materials that you need for the engineering of your own ship or whatever else. And you've gotten all this exploration credit and everything else. If your ship goes down, it takes all the cargo and all the exploration data with it. And this could be literally months of your playtime invested in this. So they take it very seriously. And I'll, it's, it's just amazing. If you ever, if you want to see a good time, look up like uh 2000 save elite dangerous fuel rats i'll put a link to the video in the uh in the show notes for this episode it it's not even like a high tension situation when you're watching it cuz it's all everybody that's taking part is so relaxed you see the call come in to dispatch they're like hey got this person here all the available fuel rats report in that's 23 jumps that's 43 jumps that's whatever you know like however many jumps it is in this case it was like 100 jumps um and then Dispatch picks two of them, the closest two. Boom, boom. You two go, and then they just start jumping. They just start jumping to that system, and then once you get there, if they're on like if they have oxygen only, they can't have their beacon up, like their little security beacon or anything else. Like it's 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 high drama on a stupid video game that it just <laughs> I love it so much, man. It's so great. Well, if you want to help us refuel, head over to <laughs> Patreon.com/slash Ritual Misery. Holy shit, look at Kent with the transitions. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Patreon.com slash Ritual Misery. You can check out uh, free stuff, like uh, free content. Uh, occasionally, we, th we throw some other stuff out there that's not related to the podcast. If you want to hear about Let's Not Talk About Thrones and you want to deep dive with three people on the Hamilton experience, uh, cruise on over there. By there, we have a tier for that. Like We have so much stuff on there. If you just want to see a video from 1996, Six? Was it, is it yep. Independence Day weekend 1996 at Myrtle <laughs> Beach? Kent with a fake guitar, me on the fake drums, neither one of us really singing. We have that in there. It's in the treasure chest. Cruise on by <laughs> patreon.com slash ritual misery and enjoy a few laughs at our miserable expense. Hell yeah. And right now it's 100% free. <laughs> it is because uh, we. Uh, and it, I mean, I'm not trying to get political here, but uh, according to the actions of some higher ups in our government, it may be another quite a while before we actually uh, start charging for our patronage uh, because, well, everybody's everybody's having problems with work right now. Like we're not trying to add to that. Help put put your money, your Patreon money. Uh, you sign up with us. That's fine. That's cool. That's good. But we're not charging right now. You can take that money that we, you would be giving us and send it to people that are actually making a living on Twitch or through their Patreon, doing podcasts, doing videos, doing whatever. Make sure that they have the support that they need right now. We don't need it to live. So we're not troubling yeah, you with but it. We want, but we want to build up our numbers. So we want to see you over there. Patreon.com right. slash Ritual Misery. I, I can't get someone on there to do 500 a month and then just randomly charge them. I need to get like 500 people on there doing a dollar a month that way, nobody cares when I just randomly charge you. See, that's, <laughs> I'm like, hey, you know what? We're going to start charging in November. And everybody's like, what? A dollar? Who gives a shit? Us, we're like, woohoo, we're going to get beers. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Hey, Kent, uh, is it about that time? It's about that time, dude. All right. Fuck it. What time is it? Kent. He's all powerful. He's extraordinary. A genius. Game. I cannot contain myself. Kent's Games. Games. Presented by Stephen Cogswell. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen Cogswell, for your, your unintentional sponsorship that we just forced on you because we suck and you're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, th- this week's game is called Apple Salute Truth. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to ask you guys about Apple, the company, and it's going to be true and false. Okay. So super easy. You got you got 50% chance to get 50% of them <laughs> right or something like that. Um, How many questions okay, so are there? Go back and forth. How many questions are there? There's 10 questions, ten five questions. questions per person. So we, we, we need a combined six to get the D. That's right. Okay. I'm just making sure I got my math right this week. But if you get seven or more, then you can beat the D. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Stephen, you're our guest. We're going to start with you. Number one, true or false, Apple founders Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak met at summer camp when they were teenagers. Uh, I'm going to have to say false. That is correct. False. They actually met at a homebrew computer club. In a garage. In the mid-70s. In a <laughs> garage. Was, was it a garage or an, or an old warehouse storage? I think it was like a storage unit. I, I could be wrong. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like, I think the first one was at like a storage unit like, that nobody was paying for. <laughs> Amos. Yeah. Your first question. Wrong. A guy named... A guy named Ronald Wayne founded Apple with Jobs and Wozniak, but sold them his share for eight hundred dollars. Ronald Wayne. Now, it's all everything there is true, except I'm not sure about the exact dollar amount, and I'm not sure about the name because uh, it's been like six years since I read that uh, the biography. Uh, I'm going to go with true, just because. Why not? It is, in fact, true. Good job. All right, you guys are on a roll so far. Steven, your next question. The first Apple One computer cost $666.66. That would be false. That is, in fact, true. Is it really? Yep. I yeah I I got this one wrong when I took this quiz myself because I I didn't make this one up I found it, um, yeah what the hell six hundred sixty six dollars and sixty six cents what a devilish price, um all right Amos your next one, a computer called the Lisa was mm-hmm. supposed to be Apple's flagship model mm-hmm. but it failed and was replaced by the Macintosh. <sighs> I think, uh, hmm. see, this is, this is, I need, I need, I need fewer beers in the last six years is what I need. Um, <laughs> I, I thought the Lisa wor- was, w- did well, but it wasn't a full computer. So then they did the Lisa two and that failed. So then they did the Macintosh. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to say false on hope that I've got that set up, that, that those steps correct. And you would be wrong. Uh, mm-hmm. The Apple Lisa was replaced by the Macintosh in 1980, or uh, the Lisa debuted in 1983, and uh, the the reason for its failure was the ridiculously high price. Uh, nobody wanted to buy it. I guess that's what uh, I was thinking about when you said price before. I was thinking of Lisa. Yeah, and it, yeah. every time I I read about the Lisa, I can't help but think about the room. You're t- tearing me apart, Lisa. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, uh, oh, hi, Steven, this goes to you. Apple's famous 1984 Super Bowl ad was directed by Steven Spielberg. Oh, dear Lord. I was like five or six at the time. I'm going to have to say... I'm going to have to say true. And you're going to have to be wrong. Probably. It was actually... <laughs> I don't know. It was actually directed by Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott. Not Steven Spielberg. All right. uh, On to you, Amos. One day in 1991, half of Apple's employees quit because the atmosphere had become, quote, too corporate. That sounds true. 
It sounds true, but it's not. It is false. <laughs> so, so I'll say false. <laughs> <laughs> Steven. Yeah. The, the first Apple store opened on November 10th, 1997 in San Francisco. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say true. It seems early. And you're going to be wrong. It was Times Square, wasn't it? Uh, you're getting closer. Um, so, in fact, the last one. I just the can't. the date November tenth, nineteen ninety seven, is when the first online Apple Store uh, opened. But the first actual store opened in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, which is like right outside of Washington D.C. And, and that was in two thousand one. <laughs> everybody remembers the big glass cube in New York City. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Amos, over to you. The original Apple logo featured Sir Isaac Newton under an apple tree. No. <laughs> so you say false. Um, I'm going to tell you no. It was, in fact, true. That's dumb. <laughs> I don't like your quiz. Steven. I think your quiz Steven, is wrong. You're, you're, you're out of order. You're going into your final question tied at one apiece. <laughs> we did not get the D. <laughs> in June 2009, Apple slashed the price of the entry-level iPhone by half. False. It, it is, in not. fact, true. Yeah. No. What? <laughs> it is, in fact, true. The price of the new iPhone dropped to a mere $99 back in 2009. Oh, my goodness. Amos, for your final Apple question. You got to get it wrong. <laughs> at Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference in June 2009, CEO Steve Jobs made a long rumored appearance in a tuxedo and delivered the keynote speech. That was right before he died, too. Yeah. Yeah. He was sick. In a, in a tuxedo? Right, you know? Uh, I, don't, I don't. I don't think I've ever seen Steve Jobs in a tuxedo. I'm going to say false. That you actually right got that correct. I was, you got it um, right. Yeah, jo Jobs was still on medical leave at well, the time, and uh, Phil Schiller, the senior vice president for product marketing, uh, did the keynote that year. I was, I was going to say because uh, I he I haven't seen him in anything other than jeans and a black turtleneck <laughs> since he yep. came back to Apple in like. 93 or whatever it was. Yeah. Like, uh, you guys didn't do so hot on this one. No. You got a, a total of three out of 10. Speak for yourself. Uh, I think three is awesome. You felt, you felt very short of the, of the D we got half the D <laughs> <laughs> I play with tech. I don't get into the see. I was, I was a young lad when all this stuff took place. Yeah. So, uh, so, so speaking of, of, um, of you getting into things when you were younger, um, you've been a tech reporter for quite a while now, uh, basically in the, the infancy of online video, I would even dare to say, um, can you, can you tell us a little bit about your, your, your history of, of tech reporting and how you kind of got into it? Yeah, I, um, you, you mentioned Twitch earlier on. I started out on Ustream.tv, if anybody remembers that. Um, I happened to see a guy on there who used to sit in front of his two big 30-inch monitors. He would, he would work on his work all day long and ignore a chat room. <laughs> and I was like, well, I know how to fix computers. You know, I learned in college and you know, I had my own business that I was doing at the time. And I was like, well, I could sit in front of a camera and just answer you know, tech, tech support questions right, for people. And so I sat down with my MacBook and <laughs> my apartment. We were in the process of moving, my wife and I. And um, I just started sitting in front of there for like 13, 14 hours a day. And, uh, you know, I'd start out with like five viewers and then it would go to 10. And then next it was 50. Next it was 100. And I just got really immersed into it. Um, I started reviewing iPhone cases, cell phone cases, cell phones, anything I could get my hands on. And that's kind of what propelled me into that space. But then it just got oversaturated. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of why 
I diverted out of there. And at the time, like you said, this online broadcasting, nobody really knew how to do it well. And mm. uh, it was a lot of cobbling together. Now you can get software. There's software that you can, you know, webcams that really give you good quality. And before, you know, if we wanted to do what you're doing here with Skype, we had to hook up massive workarounds to get Skype into a, a call like this. And um, that's kind of what drove my interest into the broadcasting because I cobbled everything together and I just kind of excelled at it. And um, almost 15 years I've been doing kind of the tech and broadcasting thing. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, so one of, one of the most uh, fascinating things that I learned about you when I was, when I was uh, doing a little bit of research in uh, getting you on as a guest was that you once interviewed the Waz himself, Steve Wozniak. How the hell did you pull that off? So I happened to stumble upon, uh, I was doing some research and I found his wife Janet's email address online and I emailed her and um, I said, hey, I'm not trying to be a stalker or anything, but I run an online show. We do a, a pretty decent amount of viewing. I said, Justin TV usually features us on the front page and you know, we were getting thousands of views at the time. And I said, hey, it'd be great to talk to Steve Waz, especially with, you know, the direction Apple's taken. At, at the time, the iPhone was locked down. You didn't really have a lot of apps like you do now. And surprisingly, she responded within 48 hours. And she was like, uh, let me see what his schedule's like. She's like, he said he'd love to do it. So let's figure out something. And I literally booked him seven months in advance. Um, oh, my God. Show. The guy is super busy, and and she she gave me his cell phone number. To this day, I still have his cell phone number, and she said, you know, I'm giving this to you and trusting that you will only use it for this for this call. Um, and I'm sure these guys change their numbers all the time, but she said, um, trusting that if he needs to get a hold of you, you can call this, or if he's running later, you can call it. Um, and she said, you've got 20 minutes with him because he's that busy. And I'm like, no worries, I'll respect it. He got on the interview, and I don't know if you guys seen it on YouTube, but it's up, it's up on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, and I was about ready to let him go, and he's like, oh, we can keep going. This is great. Let's keep doing this. So I ended up getting him for like an hour and 20 minutes, um, and he was just all about answering questions, the co-hosts that I had on with me, and, and answering the chat room. And, and it was a really, really great time to, to speak to somebody that's so legendary in the, in the tech industry. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was that was freaking awesome. Uh, besides Waz, uh, who, who would you say are, are some of your your favorite guests that you've had on? So I've I've interviewed Leo Laporte. I don't know if you guys know who he is. He's a big tech uh, reporter. Uh, yep, broadcast. we know him. <laughs> okay, so uh, I interviewed him at CES back in 2011. Alex Lindsay, who's also part of his team, I interviewed him. Um, T Pain, the rapper. And at the time, I got to admit, I didn't know who T Pain was. I didn't even know. You know, I, I didn't. I don't listen to rap. So we were in this um, ballroom at CES in Las Vegas, and we were live streaming. And uh, this this marketing gal came up, grabbed my arm, and she said, "Are you live?" I said, "Oh yeah, we're we're live. We're walking through." And she goes, "Do you want to interview T Pain?" I turned to my crew. I'm like, "Do I want to interview T Pain?" They're like, "Yes, you want to interview T Pain?" I'm like, "Yes, we want to interview T Pain." <laughs> and, uh, so we went up there, and he was talking about this microphone that could change kids' voices with distortion and add some background beats and tracks and um, I remember it came out like four or five years later, but that was pretty cool. We we interviewed Lady Gaga out at um, an NAB convention in Las Vegas. Hmm. Um, there was a bunch of different people. Just you know, she was selling, or I shouldn't say selling. She was promoting her brand new headphones that she had. Um, oh gosh, I, I've met so many different podcasters and broadcasters out out there, but I. I, I think I, I just want to say if, hold, I just want to say the idea of Lady Gaga on like at the, at a street corner with like a sales truck with like all these headphones <laughs> just spewing out of it trying to se- trying to sell her own headphones that visual <laughs> should be I mean that that's this SNL skit just waiting to happen I'm just <laughs> well and, and that was an accident that was a complete accident because the NAB conference is all about broadcasting it's a national association of broadcasters and so we were walking by the booth. And one of the my marketing gals was like, that looks like Lady Gaga. So we went over to the booth and we were like behind the booth and she was behind it. And we walked up and nobody was there. Nobody knew anything. We said, is that Lady Gaga? And they're like, yeah. I said, we're live right now. Can we talk to her? And they're, they're like, they pulled her over and she's like, yeah, let's go. We went to the back of the booth where nobody had any clue 
what was going on because there's a bunch of other stuff going on before she was making the announcement like 10 minutes before. So it was just by dumb luck that we were walking by and she was there. Um, so that was, that was kind of interesting because even at the time, you know, uh, I'm not really into Lady Gaga, but it was still, it's a celebrity, right? So you want to try to find out what they're doing. People always ask me why I like to walk around in random places when I go to <laughs> conventions. Like it's I go to known. South by and every, every year at South by I can't will tell you this. Any, anytime I go to South by, I set a day aside, like a couple of days after we get there where I know Kent's going to sleep in where mm-hmm. I can just wander and I'll grab my camera and I'll just walk and I won't have any directions. Like ask me where I'm going. I, 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 I don't fucking know, but I'm going <laughs> to go and I'm just going to keep walking. And while I haven't had, I mean, I've had a few run-ins and things like that, but I haven't had anything like that. I'm always open to that idea. Like there's some, there, there's always people around. There's always things going on that nobody notices. And I've had yep. times when I, I, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to have a seat on this bench right here at South by. And I see, I, I forgot who it was, but at the time it was one of the main CEOs pull up in a limo. He gets out of the passenger side goes over to somebody, yells at them, and then goes back and sits back in his car, and then the car, the driver drives off. And I, I remember who it was, but I was on the phone with my daughters at the time, uh, and I was like, oh my God, so-and-so just got out of a car. Oh, oh, he's yelling at this lady. Oh, this dude. Oh, oh, no, he's getting back in the car. Oh, he just left. And it was like, uh, that wouldn't happen if I hadn't just been wandering around Austin that day, you know? <laughs> Like fun it, times. It it happens, you know. And I I do some stuff in the outdoor industry, and we went to a couple conventions with there, and you see all the people from the outdoor channel, like all the big paid hunters and and guys that mm-hmm. run. And you know, you should see the people that flock all over these guys wanting, you know, autographs and stuff. And I almost feel bad for them because they're there trying to, you know, get their work done. And that's kind of how I felt with a lot of these different people. Like I didn't bum rush them for like autographs and stuff like that, but it was more or less just to just to talk to him because live was still new, you know, I mean, it was Mm. still is new, but it's not as new as it was. It was cutting edge, you know, back in 2009, 2010 really. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and were you, were you just doing it as like, as an amateur, like for fun or were you doing it for a company? Did you have your own company? What was the, uh, situation there? So I had gotten, um, laid off from the job that I was in, and I was working as a machinist. So rather than going and looking for a job, my wife and I were planning on moving. We were in Eastern PA. We were moving out to Western PA because that's where her family was at. That's where we bought a house. So I was like, well, how can I make the best of my time since my wife's still going to work, but I got laid off. And so, you know, what can I do? And that's, like I said, I started watching some live streams at the time. of Just they called them uh, life cams right where you watch somebody's life happening right it's like watching paint dry um so i wanted to be an interactive and 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 i got the slogan the most interactive tech show on the internet that was what somebody had given me um because that's what i wanted i wanted to interact with the audience just like you guys have a chat room here i wanted to answer questions i wanted to bring people on skype and answer the best i could and if i didn't know there was other people that would come on and be like oh this is what you do and you go into it and, and i was i'd like to say i was humble enough to say i don't know let's let's ask everybody else to see if they know and i think that's what really drew people to me is 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 that i wasn't afraid to say i didn't know because there's so many people on the internet that think they know everything because they know how to stream <laughs> not that we we don't know anybody like that so uh, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. You, I, right. I, I, I would go so far as to say I know how to stream. I don't know anything. <laughs> but that's but you know that was the persona back when we were doing it. Like everybody was an expert. Anybody that could do live stream was an expert, or you had to take them serious. And so I decided to do that. And so for three months I was doing that. When I moved down here, uh, I started my job. I was also. Um, working from home, which was nice. So I was free to do my own hours and everything. So I would literally, uh, before I moved to this house, 10 years, we lived in Western PA. I would sit there and no lie, there would be like three days straight where I wouldn't sleep because I was working with people in the UK, building, learning how to build websites, learning IRC networks. You mentioned that earlier in the broadcast. 
um, trying to figure out this thing we now call broadcasting, understanding why I needed a microphone, why I needed a good camera, why I needed to have um, a shot set up a certain way and have a nice background and, and things like that. So I, I just, like you guys said earlier, um, I just kept plugging away, plugging away, plugging away. And then what happened was a company named uh, Telestream, who's based out in California, they brought me on as a contractor, which they're the makers of Wirecast. You guys use OBS. They make Wirecast, which I currently work for that company now. We, we, we and, use uh, OBS because we can't afford Wirecast. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's usually what most people say. Uh, and, and, and that's understandable. And so they saw what I was doing with the live video. I had actually bought their software and they saw what I was doing. They came back to me and said, we want to sponsor you. They reimbursed me the money. And then about two years later, they invited me out to a trade show and they said, Hey, we want to bring you out to the trade show. Um, could you like do interviews and podcasts and you know, that type of thing out there? And well, I'm like, yeah, at the time, the product manager, she was pregnant and she needed to go back to her office, uh, uh, her, her hotel room. And she was like, I don't know if I can. She's like, somebody needs to watch the booth with this other guy. And I said, well, I can do it. So I ended up standing there. We had like 40 people because they, they knew my show and they were coming around and I was doing like a, a podcasting how to. Right. And after that, they offered me a job <laughs> to work remote. So I've been doing that ever since. And, um, that, that's my day job. So I get to work in broadcasting and live video. Um, but it was because of the, the many years that I put in um, just burning the candle at both ends. I don't know how else to explain it. Like when my daughter was born, I'd let my wife sleep from like, you know, she'd go to bed at, you know, midnight and sleep till 6 a.m. And I'd be up all night with, with my daughter. She'd be in the swing or I'd be holding her and feeding her, you know, with bottles um, just so my wife could sleep. And I, I was up anyways. So mm -hmm. I did what I had to do. And, uh, you know, I, I worked, you know, what <laughs> worked. I don't want to ever go back to that, but <sighs> right. a lot of work involved just doing it, building a name for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I noticed a lot of arcades behind you. Yes. <laughs> um, That's so an act. <laughs> Yeah, which my... which actually just just like uh, uh, with P Dubs from a, a couple of weeks back, I came across you because I was interested in at games and Legends Ultimate and just home arcade videos in general, and that's that's uh, where I found both of you guys. Uh, Legend Center is a new venture that you and P Dubs are doing together. How did that come about? Why did they pick? you versus um somebody not you <laughs> well so i think you've you've <sighs> talked to P -Dub and p-dub has a really electronic personality he's a very he's a very um energetic person right where i am more newsy i'm more the guy that you could sit and listen to his talk radio right mm -hmm. but i have the chops when it comes to production in fact i do a lot of production for different people behind the scenes where they hire me to produce their shows and so at games wanted something that was really high, high produced, high level. Um, and obviously high level productions cost money. Mm. So if they can work out a deal with you and get, kind of get some, you know, what, whatever, whatever kind of deal they can work out with you, you know, they're going to get a fantastic show. And that's why he kind of, the shtick is he kind of is the, the, the lead guy and I, I'm supposed to pick on him the whole time. You know, kind of give them crap because obviously I'm focused on a lot of the uh, controls in front of me to, to do a lot of the switching. And, you know, you've seen the, the virtual set. It's no secret. Right. Um, but we try to play it off that he's sitting right next to me. Right. And um, so that's what they wanted. They wanted something really at a high level. And that's kind of how I was brought into it. Um, and and they knew P-Dubs and I already had a good friendship and, and, and good chemistry. So they just figured, well, Hey, let's, let's give it a shot. Thus legend center was born. Yeah, that's great. I, and I, I told, I told Patrick this, uh, as well that, uh, I am the target audience for that show. It is so, so <laughs> up my alley. I love it so much. Um, it's great. And I, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys do with the show in the future. Cause I think there's all what three episodes in now at this point. Uh, Four, I think we were supposed to do five yesterday. He got sick. He's a type one diabetic. Mm -hmm. So he had gotten um, something was out of whack. Don't don't quote me on it, but something was out of whack to where 
I, I he, he just headaches and all kinds of stuff. Right. But yeah. anybody's diabetic knows. But um, yeah, so we couldn't do it yesterday. But um, yeah, it, I I think the first season is going to be 13 episodes long. I think that's what our contracts for. Oh, okay. And, you know, depending if I kill him or he kills me, there may or may not be a season two. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see what you guys and, have in store. And even if us. that does happen, I mean, there's always somebody who can replace one of us. I mean, it's that simple. So, so uh, we, if, we've all seen dream sequences we, we before. Have, <laughs> we have Steven on the record right now saying that P Dubs is replaceable. <laughs> <laughs> he said. That, what was it? The one episode he says to me, he says, I needed Laurel. Legends. Anybody know who Laurel legends is? Mm. If you don't go look, go look her up on YouTube and you'll see why I said in that show, I take that as a compliment. Uh, this is what you gave me instead of Laurel legends. So I take that as a compliment, but, um, yeah, so this, this all started by accident. It started because of a childhood memory. I bought rampage an arcade one up first time I ever seen it at Walmart. My kids were there, 300 bucks. And I says to my kids, I was like, my brother and I used to play this game on Nintendo all the time. And my, my wife's like, yeah, get it. You know, so we brought it home. One arcade turned into two, which turned into three, which turned into going out Thanksgiving night and almost getting killed to get Pac-Man. Uh, <laughs> turning into, um, I think I'm at 12 cabinets now, a Toy Shock pinball, the At Games Legend, and I'll have the at games pinball coming at some point, but yeah, my, my daughter says I'm out of control. <laughs> I, I think basement. I think your game room is, is absolutely <laughs> epic. I would kill for that is that is freaking awesome. It takes time to build. And that's how I got. So going along with the question you asked about, you know, the tech, I left the tech and I, and I still do stuff in the broadcasting because it's part of my day. But I came over to the gaming industry because I saw that nobody was doing live shows. Nobody. There was no Legend Center. There was nothing really going on. Guys were going live with just like a webcam and saying, or a phone and going, hey, you know, this is my arcade room. So I contacted Glenn Planamento, which is Glenn's retro show. Uh, Doug Smith, who's cool toy. I don't know if you guys have seen these guys. They're pretty big YouTubers. Um, at the time, and I contacted them and I said, hey, I'm just reaching out. I know how to broadcast. This is my stuff. This is what I do. This is the type of video I do. And I've just been dabbling with these arcades. I'm no expert. I just have a love for this and the retro gaming. And I said, how would you guys like to do a show together? And I'll produce it. And you guys kind of, so that's when the retro buzz was born that we do every Friday night. Yeah. That's awesome. That's, that's freaking that's awesome. That's how I got into this whole arcade spiel. It was completely by accident. Just and, trying and to have some. And just so we're all on the same page, you've clearly peaked because now you're on the Richard Misery podcast. So, <laughs> yes. Well, this is the highlight. Well, I didn't even get to that point. You were going to ask me what, what the highlight of my, my, my journey was, and it's obviously to be on the show. <laughs> well, we're so, glad to have you here for sure. Um, well, I, you guys have me. I want to ask you about some of your equipment. Now, you've got a pretty epic studio. Like, my studio. My my studio impresses all my all all three of my friends. <laughs> all, three, all, three. Only all three, all three, all three of them, all three of them are like, holy <laughs> crap, dude! That's a nice nice setup you got there. Um, your setup probably contains as much design in a single component as my office slash studio does in its entirety. So I want to know, like. When when did you decide? Like, what was your deciding point to say, you know what, I'm just going to go all out on this? Oh, um, I guess when I first started getting sponsors, um, I had GoDaddy. I think I was three years in, and I and I've told this story before, but um, people didn't believe me until I showed 1099s on air, and then they believed me. Um, I was three years in, and GoDaddy approached me, and they said, we want to sponsor your show. I'm like, hey, this is great. And at the time, I was producing two other shows along with my two shows. And I was doing this in the evenings after work, just like you guys are doing, you know. And uh, GoDaddy says, we'll pay you $20 for every .com domain that you sell. And we'll have a promo code. It'll be like TTB199. So people can get a $1.99.com domain. And I'm not going into a spiel because it doesn't work anymore. 
Um, <laughs> and that would, we would get 20 bucks. The one year I made close to $35,000 from GoDaddy just in ad, just in ad revenue. And I had to show it wow. because people were like being really stupid. You know, how people are on the internet, you know, I showed a 1099. I just covered up my address and, and, and I d- didn't really even care because you could probably find it if you wanted it. Um, and I was like, look, I was telling my story and I said, I had people that they would, they would run four shows a month and they, they were making $600 a month just to do their shows. The one gal actually didn't work part time. Like she was still in college. She quit her job because she was like, I can live off of 600 bucks a month. She's living at home. So she did the show once a month or, or, or four times a week, a, a four times a month, but she was doing it. Uh, I think we had GoDaddy for almost two years. So we did that. Uh, so we, we were making some good money from GoDaddy and that was just one sponsor. We had a few other ones. So I'm working full time and I'm producing these shows. So when that happened, I needed redundancy to answer your question. I needed something that I could rely on. I needed something that I knew that when I turned the switch on, it was going to work because sponsors and audience, I needed it. I never did the Patreon thing. I never did like any of that stuff. So um, I guess that's a new way of doing things. So I always went to companies to see if they wanted to sponsor. And so that's kind of how, how I started making money to do this. And then what happened was companies started sending me gear. So um, I can kind of show you if you want. If you want to see a little bit here, um, this is kind of like the brain of the studio. This is my my rack with everything known to man on it. Um, no, not really everything known to man, but got my call in center, my 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 switcher, my <laughs> SDI switcher. This basically runs the whole studio, everything in that. And, and that's that, a nice rack. <laughs> yeah, my wife gets a little jealous, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then i've got uh so you'll see me occasionally you'll see me turn to look at the i have some monitors on the on the wall there they're a little bit hard to see but um I could kind of let's dial back here a little bit you guys can see so this was one of the things when we saw this house um it had a bar in it and i saw the bar as something different than what you guys would see it as um i'm not a drinker so but i saw it as a good platform where i could broadcast so this is my my broadcast area um where i do all the shows it's it's insane this yeah that is and you're right uh we see it as something different because kent would have made it a bar and then podcasted out of a closet and i (laughs) would have made it a bar slash set so it might mine would have been a combination between the two It'd, it'd be just like yours except less gear and more alcohol (laughs) <laughs> it, would, it, it would have been the hybrid of the two. Let me see if I can do this. Oh, this is my good shot. setup. Did that switch over? Yeah. Yeah. Switch. Yeah. Okay. So at, 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 during a show, Legend Center, doesn't matter what show we're doing. I have a joystick over here that can control the camera that you just saw. I've got little hot keys that are set up the way I want to do it. This is my main switching board. And then this controls my wirecast setup. And then I've got you guys right here. But I also have you up on a screen. And then um, my call-in system, I can activate it here. And then web browsers I can pull in from this laptop. So this is all going on during Legend Center. This is I, I don't think people... If people knew that sometimes, that would give a new new appreciation of somebody like pretending to produce it. Because like, that's, that's the goal, right? When I'm doing the show with P-Dubs, I'm pretending like we have producers. Right. That's That's the whole... Right. You know, yeah. Be, so yeah. I. So when you so when you call out the the monkeys in the truck, you're calling out yourself. I'm calling out myself, <laughs> and and so that's the illusion that we're trying to do because I I want to give that that type of a, a persona for that for that particular show, and um, again, it's everything's redundant. So if if one of those pieces of equipment die, I have a complete mirror setup. Like if you were like I wouldn't call you up and say, crap, I can't feed you a signal. I just have to hit a switch and switch it over. And that's the way I designed it in here. Um, going back to way earlier when you said about how long did it take you to build the studio? Yeah. When I read it, I wanted to do it right to where I had redundancy because for my job, I create videos. I create live shows for them. In fact, we're, we're in the process of, of setting up a live show that's going to come out in a couple months. So I do that here. So it's not just for 
my own pleasure. It's, it's partly for my job. So, um, you know, it's just, just time learning how this stuff works. And, um, I, like I said, I might not be the best on camera host that, that there's probably tons of people out there that are better than me and I'm okay with that. But my niche is really getting in the cockpit here and making magic happen on camera. It's amazing. Yeah, so, that's pretty great. And, and where would, where would people go to, to see the shows that you produce? Uh, basically the techbuzz.net. You can find everything on there. Um, I usually upload just about everything there. My YouTube channel. Um, I'm all about helping people. So if, if you want to try to do live production and you're interested in making it better, uh, you can ping me. I'll, I'll gladly help. Uh, I've done that with some of the other guys too. That's, that's one of the things that I wanted to be able to do. Even coming over to the gaming scene, show people how you could capture the game screen rather than just pointing a camera over your shoulder. Um, yeah, and doing that. So. Yeah. I've got a video capture device, Avis. What are you talking about? <laughs> not, not for your first arcade stream you didn't yeah no no that was that was a disaster <laughs> he, had a, he had a macbook pro with a camera like stuck up on something on the side it, it was well no 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 it was even worse than that i it was when um it was when the legends ultimate first um started allowing streaming to youtube and facebook and and twitch i was sending a a stream to youtube and then I was capturing YouTube within OBS as part of my OBS setup. So I was doing a, a camera feed plus the YouTube stream, but I had to, I was sending the YouTube stream up and I was pulling it back down for OBS. Killed my bandwidth. Absolutely killed my bandwidth. Uh, I was going to say all this from a guy that can barely keep a Skype stream going most of the days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, <laughs> It was awful, and in fact, it's it's on YouTube. If you look up Legends Ultimate uh, Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, um, you can see how how terrible it was. <laughs> that so was one awesome. of the first things that I said to PK with with at games. I said, because um, I'm I'm going to put it out there. You know, they did send me the cabinet. They did you know take care of it. So I always disclaim that stuff because I don't want people to think you know I'm doing any kind of shady stuff. But I said. One of the things that I want to show is how you can capture the video on it. Like instead of doing this, all this workaround stuff where you can buy a, a $15 HDMI splitter and hook it in the back of your cabinet and send it to a capture card. Right. So, mm -hmm. so guys can do stuff like that. So, um, it's, it's, it's amazing to see how this stuff is, has just changed. I mean, I, I'm assuming you, what you both got a, a legends ultimate or no, just, just me. Just you. Okay. So he just sits there and makes fun of you while you're trying That's to That's right. That's oh, okay. right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. I, I can has drone. Oh, yeah. You're, nice. Yeah, you're the drone guy. I, I'm, nice. I'm the gearhead. He's the money guy. Like, he doesn't like to spend the money, and I like to have all the gears. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, my wife, yeah. wife will say that. Well, what do you need that for? Why? But now yeah. when it comes to broadcasting stuff, I can tell her, hey, I need a $3,000 camera. She'll look, okay. Because she knows I make money with it. But if I said, right. I really want to get that Star Wars sit-down cabinet. She goes, how much is it? 500 bucks. Really? Do you need that? No. <laughs> but I want it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's usually pretty good. I usually don't want to beg too hard. That's fantastic. All right, I think it's uh, I think it's about time we wrap this up. The techbuzz.net is where everybody needs to go to check out everything that Steven's got going on. Yep. Uh, Amos, uh, where where should people follow you on the web? You can follow me on Twitter at Ethan Kane. E T H A N C A I N E. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Said in pairs, a vowel and a consonant each time, except for the last, <sighs> when it was just a vowel because there were no more consonants worthy of my Twitter nick. And Ethan I'm Kane. RM underscore Del Noche on Twitter. Because he's got the there. underscore because he's special. Yeah, I was late to the Twitter game. <laughs> um, you can also check out the show at Ritual Misery on Twitter. Yep. Um, and uh, you can, uh, well, wait, before we get to the rest of that kit. Two weeks. Tuscan Sam's going to be on. 
<laughs> TS and TSC and Sam is in fact going to be our guest two weeks from tonight. Uh, next and, week, not sure exactly what it's going to be, but it looks like it might be another Legends Ultimate Arcade stream. Uh, either way, we're going to do something fun, so so be sure to join us um, for the audio listeners. That is live on twitch.tv slash misery every Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific. I forgot to stream this to Discord. I suck at life. Yeah, well... This well, this is well, what happens. Is, this is what happens when I mow the grass and don't drink beer on a Thursday. Uh, but <sighs> the great thing about Discord, though, is that for our post shows, we hang out in our voice channel on Discord. And if you're not already a member, you can go to bit.ly/rmpdiscord and hang out with us. And it won't cost you anything but your time, which we can't compensate you for. And let's just be honest, that's kind of yours to give, not ours to take. So cruise on by Discord at uh, yeah at, at the thing that Kent just said, because now I can't see it. Bit.ly slash RMP. There we go. I got I gotta I gotta redo this whole sheet, man. Like I can't find anything anymore. We are live every Thursday at 7 p.m. Pacific on diamondclub.tv and twitch.tv slash ritual misery. And I say seven o'clock, it's it's around about that. Usually. Sometimes. We want to say thank you to Kevin McLeod for allowing us to use your music. Uh, you're also the soundtrack of basically 98% of the internet. So thank you very much. And half Thanks Hollywood. for listening. For Hamas, for Steven, and for me, and for you, more importantly, this has been your... You're worse at the timing than I am, Kent. See if this will work. That didn't work. It didn't work. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> R-A-T-U-A-L-M-I-S-E-L-Y. They finally worked. <laughs> 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 <laughs>